Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 1. A Suspicious Jeweler Well, Tom Swift, I don't believe you will make any mistake if you buy that diamond, said the jeweler to a young man who was inspecting a tray of pins set with the sparkling stones. It is of the first water and without a flaw. It certainly seems so, Mr. Track. I don't know much about diamonds, and I'm depending on you. But this one looks to be all right. Is it for yourself, Tom? <laughs> no, that is not exactly. And Tom Swift, the young inventor of airships and submarines, blushed slightly. Ah, I see. It's for your housekeeper, Mrs. Baggert. Well, I think she would like a pin of this sort. True, it's rather expensive, but... No, it isn't for Mrs. Baggert, Mr. Track, and Tom seemed a bit embarrassed. Oh, well then, Tom, of course it's none of my affair except to sell you a good stone. But if this brooch is for a young lady, I can't recommend anything nicer. Do you think you'll take this, or do you prefer to look at some others? Oh, I think this will do, Mr. Track. I guess I'll take... Tom's words were interrupted by a sudden action on the part of the jeweler. Mr. Track ran from behind the showcase and hastened toward the front door. "'Did you see him, Tom?' he cried. "'I wonder which way he went.' "'Who?' asked the lad, following the shopkeeper. "'That man. He's been walking up and down in front of my place for the last ten minutes, ever since you've been in here, in fact, and I don't like his looks.' "'What did he do?' Nothing much except to stare in here as if he was sizing my place up. Sizing it up? Yes, getting the lay of the land so he or some confederate could commit a robbery, maybe. A robbery? Do you think that man was a thief? I don't know that he was, Tom, and yet a jeweler has to be always on the watch. And that isn't a joke, either, Tom Swift. Swindlers and thieves are always on the alert for a chance to rob a jewelry store and they work many games. I didn't notice any particular man looking in here, said Tom, who still held the diamond brooch in his hand. Well, I did, went on the jeweler. I happened to glance out of the window when you were looking at the pins, and I saw his eyes staring in here in a suspicious manner. He may have a confederate with him, and when you're gone, one may come in and pretend to want to look at some diamonds. Then, when I'm showing him some, the other man will enter, engage my attention, and the first man will slip out with a diamond ring or pin. It's often done. You seem to have it all worked out, Mr. Track, observed the lad with a smile. How do you know but what I'm in with a gang of thieves, and I'm only pretending to want to buy a diamond pin? Oh, I guess I haven't known you, Tom Swift, ever since you were big enough to toddle. Not to be sure about what you're up to but I certainly didn't like the looks of that man. However, let's forget about him. He seems to have gone down the street, and after all, perhaps I was mistaken. Just wait until I show you a few more styles before you decide. The young lady may like one of these. And the jeweler went to another showcase and took out some more trays of brooches. What makes you think she's a young lady, Mr. Track? asked the lad. Oh, it's easy guessing, Tom. We jewelers are good readers of character. I can size up a young fellow coming in here to buy an engagement or a wedding ring as soon as he enters the door. I suppose you'll soon be in the market for one of those, Tom, if all the reports I hear about you are true. You and a certain Mary Nestor? I, uh, I think I don't care for any of these pins, spoke Tom quickly with a blush. I like the first lot best. I think I'll take the one I had in my hand when that man alarmed you. Ah, uh, that's odd. What did I do with it? Tom looked about the showcase and glanced down on the floor. He had mislaid the brooch, but the jeweler with a laugh lifted it out of a tray a moment later. I saw you lay it down, he said. We jewelers have to be on the watch. Here it is. I'll just put it in a box and... With an exclamation, Mr. Track gave a hasty glance toward his big show window. Tom looked up and saw a man's face peering in. At the sight of it, he, too, uttered a cry of surprise. The next instant, the man outside knocked on the glass, apparently with a piece of metal, making a sharp sound as soon as he heard it. The jeweler once more sprang from behind the showcase and leaped for the door, crying, 
There's the thief. He's trying to cut a hole through my show window and reach in and get something. It's an old trick. I'll get the police. Tom, you stay here on guard. And before the lad could utter a protest, the jeweler had opened the door and was speeding down the street in the gathering darkness. Tom stared about him in some bewilderment. He was left alone in charge of a very valuable stock of jewelry, the owner of which was racing after a supposed thief, crying, Please help! Thieves, stop him, somebody! This is a queer go, mused Tom. I wonder who that man was. He looked like somebody I know, and yet I can't seem to place his face. I wonder if he was trying to rob the place. Maybe there's another one, a confederate around here. This thought rather alarmed Tom, so he went to the door and looked up and down the street. He could see no suspicious characters, but in the direction in which the jeweler was running, there was a little throng of people following Mr. Track, after the man who had knocked on the window. I wish I was there instead of here, mused the lad. Still, I can't leave, or a thief might come in. Perhaps that was the game, and one of the gang is hanging around, hoping the store will be deserted, so he can enter and take what he likes. Tom had read of such cases, and he at once resolved that he would not only remain in the jewelry shop, but that he would lock the door, which he at once proceeded to do. Then he breathed easier. The town of Shopton, in the outskirts of which Tom lived with his father, and where the scene above narrated took place, was none too well lighted at night, and the lad had his doubts about the jeweler catching the oddly acting man, especially as the latter had a good start. But someone may head him off, reasoned Tom, though if they do catch him, I don't see what they can prove against him. Hello, here I am, carrying this diamond pin around. I might lose it. Yes, I'll put it back on the tray. He replaced in the proper receptacle one of the pins he had been examining when the excitement occurred. I wonder if Mary will like that, he said softly. I hope she does. Perhaps it would be better if she could come here herself and pick out one. Tom's musing was suddenly interrupted by a sharp tattoo on the glass door of the jewelry shop. With a start, he looked up to see staring in on him the face of the man who had been there before, the man of whom the jeweler was even then in chase. Why, why, stammered Tom. The man knocked again. Tom, Tom Swift, he called. Don't you know me? Know you? You? repeated the lad. Yes. Don't you remember Earthquake Island, how we were nearly killed there? Don't you remember Mr. Jenks? Mr. Jenks. Tom was so startled that he could only repeat words after the strange man, who was talking to him from outside the glass door. Yes, Mr. Jenks, was the reply. Mr. Barco Jenks, who makes diamonds. I saw you in the store about to buy a diamond. I wanted to tell you. Not to. I'll give you a better diamond than you can buy. I just arrived in this place. I must have a private talk with you. Come out. I'll share a wonderful secret with you. A flood of memory came to Tom. He did recall the very strange man who walked around Earthquake Island, where Tom and some friends had been marooned recently, walked about with a pocket full of what he said were diamonds. Now Barco Jinx was here. I must see you privately, Tom Swift, went on Mr. Jinx, as he once more tapped on the glass. Don't waste money buying diamonds, when you and I can make better ones. Where can I have a talk with you? I, Mr. Jinks, suddenly looked down the dimly lighted street. They're coming back, he cried. I don't want to be seen. I'll call at your house later tonight. Be on the watch for me. Until then, goodbye. He waved his hand and was gone in an instant. Tom stood staring at the glass door. He hardly knew whether to believe it or not. Perhaps it was all a dream. He pinched himself to make sure that he was awake. Very substantial flesh met his thumb and finger, and he felt the pain. I'm awake all right, he murmured, but Barco Jinx here and still talking that nonsense about his manufactured diamonds. I think he must be crazy. I wonder. Once more the lad's musings was interrupted. He heard a murmur of excited voices outside the store on the street. Then the door of the jewelry shop was tried. Mr. Track's face was pressed against glass. 
Open the door. Let me in, Tom, he called. I've caught the thief. And as the lad unlocked the portal, he saw that the jeweler held by the arm a ragged lad. Ah, you scoundrel, I've caught you, cried the diamond merchant, shaking the small chap, while Tom looked on more mystified than ever. End of chapter one. Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 2 A Midnight Visit While Mr. Track, the jeweler, and several citizens, attracted by the chase after the supposed thief, are crowded into the store, anxious to hear explanations of the strange affair, I will take the opportunity to tell you something of Tom Swift, the lad who is to figure in this story. Many of you have already made his acquaintance, when he has been speeding about in his airship or fast electric runabout, and to others we will state that our hero first made his bow to the public in the book called Tom Swift and His Motorcycle, the initial volume of this series. In that story there was related how Tom made the acquaintance of an odd individual named Mr. Wakefield Damon, who was continually blessing himself some part of his anatomy or his possessions. Mr. Damon was riding a motorcycle, and it started to climb a tree, to his pain and fright. After Tom purchased the machine and had many adventures on it, including a chase after a gang of men who had stolen a valuable patent model belonging to Mr. Swift, Mr. Swift and his son were both inventors. They lived together in a fine house in the suburbs of Shopton, New York, and with them dwelt Mrs. Baggert, the housekeeper, for Tom's mother was dead, and also Garrett Jackson, an expert engineer, who aided the young inventor and his father in perfecting many machines. There was also another semi-member of the household, to wit, Eradicate Sampson, an eccentric man who owned a mule called Boomerang. Eradicate did odd jobs around the place, and the mule assisted his owner. That is, when the mule felt like it. In the second volume of the series, entitled Tom Swift and His Motorboat, there was related the incidents following a pursuit after a gang of unprincipled men who sought to get possession of some of Mr. Swift's patents. And it was while in this boat that Tom, his father, and a friend, Ned Newton, rescued from Lake Carlopa a Mr. John Sharp, who fell from his burning balloon. Mr. Sharp was a skilled aeronaut, and after his recovery, he joined Tom in building a big airship called the Red Cloud. Tom's adventures in this craft are set down in detail in the third volume of the series called Tom Swift and His Airship. Not only did he and Mr. Sharp and Mr. Damon make a great trip, but they captured some bank robbers, and incidentally cleared themselves from the imputation of having looted the vault of $75,000, which charge was fostered by a certain Mr. Folger and his son Andy, who was Tom's enemy. Not satisfied with having conquered the air, Tom and his father set to work to gain a victory over the ocean. They built a boat that could navigate underwater, and in the fourth book of the series called Tom Swift and His Submarine Boat, you will find an account of how they went under the ocean to secure a sunken treasure, and the fight they had with their enemies who sought to get it away from them. They went through many perils, not the least of which was captured by a foreign warship, in the fifth book, entitled Tom Swift and His Electric Runabout, there was told the story of a wonderfully speedy electric automobile the young inventor constructed, and how he made a great race in it, and saved from ruin a bank, in which his father and Mr. Damon were interested. Tom's ability as an inventor had, by this time, become well known. One day, as related in a volume called Tom Swift, and his wireless message, he received a letter from a Mr. Hosmer Fenwick of Philadelphia asking his aid in perfecting an airship, which the resident of the Quaker City had built, but which would not work. In a small monoplane, the Butterfly, Tom and Mr. Damon went to Philadelphia as Mr. Damon was acquainted with Mr. Fenwick. Tom carefully inspected the Whizzer, which was the name of Mr. Fenwick's airship and after some difficulty succeeded in getting the electric craft in shape to make a flight. Tom, Mr. Damon, and Mr. Fenwick started to make a trip to Cape May in the Whizzer, but were caught in a terrific storm and blown out to sea. 
The wind became a hurricane. The airship was disabled and wrecked in midair. When it fell to earth, it landed on one of the small West Indian islands. But what was the terror of the three castaways to find that the island was subject to earthquake shocks? But the earth tremors were not the only surprise in store for Tom and his two friends. On the island they found five men and two ladies, who by strange chance had been stranded there when the yacht Resolute, owned by Mr. George Hosbrook, was wrecked in the same storm that disabled the airship. Mr. Hosbrook, a millionaire, was taking a party of friends to the West Indies. When the castaways, among whom were Mr. and Mrs. Amos Nestor, parents of Mary Nestor, a girl of whom Tom was very fond, found there was danger of the island being destroyed in an earthquake. They were in despair. There seemed no way of being rescued, as the island was out of the line of regular ship travel. Tom, however, was resourceful. With the electrical apparatus from the wrecked airship, he built a wireless plant and sent messages for help broadcast over the ocean. They were finally heard and answered by an operator on board the steamer Cambaranian, which came in under forced draft and rescued Tom and his friends. It was only just in time, for no sooner had they gotten aboard the steamer and lifeboats than the whole island was destroyed by an earthquake shock. But Tom, the parents of Mary Nestor, Mr. Damon, Mr. Fenwick, and all the others got safely home. Among the survivors from the yacht Resolute was a Mr. Barco Jinks, who now most unexpectedly had confronted Tom through the glass window of the jewelry store. Mr. Jinks was a peculiar man. Tom discovered this on Earthquake Island. Mr. Jinks carried with him some stones which he said were diamonds. He asserted that he had made them, but Tom did not know whether or not to believe this. When it seemed that the castaways would not be saved, Mr. Jinks offered Tom a large sum in these same diamonds for some plan whereby he might escape the earthquakes. Mr. Jinks said there was a certain secret in connection with the manufactured diamonds that he had solved that he had been defrauded to his rights, and that a certain phantom mountain figured in it. But Tom at that time paid little attention to Mr. Jinks' talk. The time was to come, however, when he would attach much importance to it. When this story opens, Tom was more interested in Mr. Barco Jinks than in anyone else, and was wondering what he wanted to see him about. The young inventor could not quite understand how Mr. Track, the jeweler, could come back with the lad he suspected of being a thief, when the person who had acted so suspiciously and who had knocked on the glass was the queer man, Mr. Jinks. Yes, Tom, I caught him, the jeweler went on. I chased after him and nabbed him. It was hard work, too, for I'm not a good runner. Now, you little rascal, tell me why you tried to rob my store. And the diamond merchant shook the lad roughly. I, I didn't try to rob your store was the timid answer. Well, perhaps you didn't exactly, but your confederates did. Why did you ramp on the glass? And why were you staring so intently? I was looking in. Well, if it wasn't you, it was someone just like you. But why did you run when I raced down the street? I, I don't know. And the lad began to snivel. I, I just ran, that's all, because I see everybody else running. And I thought there was a fire. Huh. That's a likely story. You ran because you were guilty. I'm going to hand you over to the police. Did he get anything, Mr. Track? asked one of the men who had joined the jeweler in the chase. No, I can't say that he did. He didn't get a chance. Tom Swift was in here at the time, but this fellow was only waiting for a chance to steal, or else to aid his confederates. But if he didn't take anything, I don't see how you can have him arrested, went on the man. On suspicion, that's how, asserted Mr. Track. Will someone get me a constable? I wouldn't call a constable, said Tom quietly. Why not? Because that isn't the person who looked in your window. How do you know, Tom? Because that person came back while you were out. I saw him. You saw him? Did he try to steal any of my diamonds, Tom? No, I guess he didn't need any. Why not? There was wonder in the jeweler's tone. Why, he claims he can make all he wants. 
Make diamonds? So he says. Why, he must be crazy. And Mr. Track laughed. Perhaps he is, admitted Tom. I'm only telling you what he says. He's the person who acted so suspiciously. He came back here, I'm telling you, while you were running down the street and spoke to me. Oh, then you know him? The jeweler's voice was suspicious. I didn't at first, admitted Tom, but when he said he was Mr. Barco Jinks, I remembered that I had met him when I was cast away on Earthquake Island. And he says he can make diamonds, asked Mr. Track. What did he want of you? And the jeweler looked at Tom quizzically. He wanted to have a talk with me, replied the lad, and when he saw me in your store, he tried to attract my attention by knocking on the glass. That's a queer way to do, declared Mr. Track. What did he want? I don't know exactly, answered Tom, not caring to go into details just then. But I'm sure, Mr. Track, that you've got the wrong person there. That lad never looked in the window, nor knocked on the glass. That's right, I didn't asserted the captive. The jeweler looked doubtful. Why did you run? he asked. I told you I thought there was a fire. That's right. I don't believe he's the fellow you want, put in another man. I was standing on the corner near White's grocery store, and I noticed this lad. That was before I heard you yelling, and saw you coming, and then I joined the chase. I guess the man you were after got away, Track. He did, asserted Tom. He came back here a little while ago, and he ran away just now, as he heard you coming. Where did he go? asked the jeweler eagerly. I don't know, answered Tom. Only you've got the wrong lad here. Well, perhaps I have, admitted the diamond merchant. You can go, youngster, but next time, don't run if you're not guilty. I thought there was a fire, repeated the lad, as he hurriedly slipped through the crowd in the store and disappeared down the dark street. Yep, yeah, I guess the excitement's all over, and anyhow, you weren't robbed, Track, said a stout man as he left the store. The others soon followed, and Tom and the jeweler were once more alone in the shop. Can you tell me something about this man, Tom? asked Mr. Track eagerly. So he really makes diamonds? Who is he? I'd rather not tell just now, replied the young inventor. I don't take much stock in him myself. I think he's visionary. He may think he has made diamonds, and he may have made some stones that look like them. I'm very skeptical. If you could bring me some, Tom, I could soon tell whether they were real or not. Can you? The lad shook his head. I don't expect to see Mr. Jinks again, he said. He talked rather wildly about waiting to meet me, that man is odd, crazy, perhaps, and I don't imagine I'll see him. He's harmless, but he's eccentric. Well, there was quite some excitement for a time. I should say there was. I thought it was a plan to rob me, and the jeweler began putting away the diamond pins. In fact, the excitement so filled the minds of himself and Tom that neither of them thought any more of the object of the lad's visit and the young inventor departed without purchasing the pin he had come after. It was not until he was out on the street walking toward his home that the matter came back to his mind. I declare, he exclaimed, I didn't get that pin for Mary, after all. Now, never mind, I have a week until her birthday, and I can get it tomorrow. He walked rapidly toward home, for the weather looked threatening, and Tom had no umbrella. He was musing on the happenings of the evening when he reached his house. His father was out, as was Garrett Jackson, the engineer, and Mrs. Baggert, the housekeeper, was entertaining a lady in the sitting-room, so as Tom was rather tired, he went directly to his own room, and a little later got into bed. It was shortly after midnight, when he was awakened by hearing a rattling on the window of his room. The reason he was able to fix the time so accurately was because, as soon as he awakened, he pressed a little electric button, and it illuminated the face of a small clock on his bureau. The hands pointed to five minutes past twelve. Oh, that sounds like hail, exclaimed Tom, as he arose and looked out of the casement. 
I wonder if any of the skylights of the airship shed are open. There might be some damage. Guess I'd better go out and take a look. He had mentally reasoned this far before he had looked out, and when he saw that the moon was brightly shining in a clear sky, he was a bit surprised. Hey, that wasn't hail, he murmured. It isn't even raining. I wonder what it was. He was answered a moment later, for a shower of fine gravel from the walk flew up and clattered against the glass. With a start, Tom looked down and saw a dark figure standing under an apple tree. Hello, who's there? called the lad after he had raised the sash. It is I, Mr. Jinks, was the surprising answer. Mr. Jinks, repeated Tom. Yes, Marco Jinks of Earthquake Island. You here? What do you want? Can you come down? What for? Tom Swift, I've something very important to tell you, was the answer in a low voice, yet which carried to Tom's ears perfectly. Do you want to make a fortune for yourself and for me? No. Tom was beginning to think more and more that Mr. Jinks was crazy. How? By helping me to discover the secret of Phantom Mountain where the diamonds are made. Will you? Wait a minute. I'll come down, answered Tom, and he began to grope for his clothes in the dim light of the little electric lamp. What was the secret of Phantom Mountain? What did Mr. Jinks really want? Could he make diamonds? Tom asked himself these questions as he hastily dressed to go down to his midnight visitor. End of Chapter 2 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 3 A Strange Story well, Mr. Jinks, began Tom, when he had descended to the garden and greeted the man who had acted so strangely on Earthquake Island, this is rather an odd time for a visit. I realized that, Tom Swift, was the answer, and the lad noticed that the man spoke much more calmly than he had that evening at the jewelry shop. I realized that, but I have to be cautious in my movements. Why? Because there are enemies on my track. If they thought I was seeking aid to discover the secret of Phantom Mountain, my life might pay the forfeit. Are you in earnest, Mr. Jinks? I certainly am, and I must apologize for awakening you at this unseemly hour, and for the mysterious nature of my visit. If you will let me tell my story, you will see the need for secrecy. Oh, I don't mind being awakened, answered Tom good-naturedly. But I will be frank with you, Mr. Jinks. I hardly can believe what you have stated to me several times, that you know how diamonds can be made. I can prove it to you, was the quiet answer. Yes, I know, for centuries men have tried to discover the secret of transmuting base metals into gold, and how to make diamonds by chemical means, but they have all been failures. All except this process, the process used at Phantom Mountain, insisted the queer man. Do you want to hear my story? I have no objections. Then let me warn you, went on Mr. Jinks, that if you do hear it, you will be so fascinated by it that I am sure you will want to cast your lot in with mine and aid me to get my rights and solve the mystery. I also want to warn you that if you do, there is a certain amount of danger connected with it. I'm used to danger, answered Tom quietly. Let me hear your story, but first explain how you came to come here, and why you acted so strangely at the jewelry store. Willingly, I tried to attract your attention at the store because I saw that you were going to buy a diamond, and I didn't want you to. Why not? Because I want to present you with a beautiful stone that will answer your purpose as well or better than any one you could buy. That will prove my story better than any amount of words or argument. But I could not attract your attention without also attracting that of the jeweler. He became suspicious, gave chase, and I thought it best to vanish. I hoped no one was made to suffer for what may have been my imprudence. No, the lad whom Mr. Track caught was let go. But how did you happen to come to Shopton? To see you. I got your address from the owner of the yacht, Resolute. 
I knew that if there was one person who could aid me to recover my rights, it would be you, Tom Swift. Will you help me? Will you come with me to discover the secret of Phantom Mountain? If we go, it will have to be in an airship, for in no other way, I think, can we come upon the place as it is closely guarded. Will you come? I will pay you well. Perhaps I had better hear your story, said the young inventor. But first let me suggest that we move farther away from the house. My father or Mr. Jackson or the housekeeper may hear us talking, and it may disturb them. Come with me to my private shop. And Tom led the way to a small building where he did experimental work. He unlocked the door with a key he carried, turned on the lights, which were run by a storage battery, and motioned Mr. Jinks to a seat. Now I'll hear your story, said Tom. I'll make it as short as possible, went on the queer man. To begin with, it is now several years ago since a poorly dressed stranger applied to me one night for money enough to get a meal and a bed to sleep in. I was living in New York City at the time, and this was midnight, as I was returning home from my club. I was touched by the man's appearance and gave him some money. He asked for my card, saying he would repay me some day. I gave it to him, in little thinking I would hear from the man again. But I did. He called at my apartments about a week later, saying he had secured work as an expert setter of diamonds and wanted to repay me. I did not want to take his money, but the fact that such a sorry-looking specimen of manhood as he had been when I aided him was an expert handler of gems interested me. I talked with the man, and he made a curious statement. This man, who gave his name as Enos Falwell, said he knew a place where diamonds could be made, partly in a scientific manner and partly by the forces of nature. I laughed at him, but he told me so many details that I began to believe him. He said he and some other friends of his, who were diamond cutters, had a plant in the midst of the Rocky Mountains, where they had succeeded in making several small but very perfect diamond. They had come to the end of the rope, though, so to speak, because they could not afford to buy the materials needed. Baldwell said that he and his companions had temporarily separated, had left the mountain where they made diamonds, and agreed to meet there later when they had more money with which to purchase materials. They had all agreed to go out into civilization and work for enough funds to enable them to go on with their diamond-making. I hardly knew whether to believe the man or not, but he offered proof. He had several small but very perfect diamonds with him, and he gave them to me to have them tested in any way I desired. I promised to look into the matter, and as I was quite wealthy, as in fact I am now, and if I found that the stones he gave me were real, I said, I might invest the money in the plant. Were the diamonds good? asked Tom, who was beginning to be interested. They were. Stones of the first water, though small. An expert gem merchant to whom I took them said he had never seen any diamonds like them, and he wanted to know where I got them. Of course, I did not tell him. To make a long story short, I saw Falwell again, told him to communicate with his companions, and to tell them that I would agree to supply the cash needed, if I could share in the diamond making. To this they agreed, and after some weeks spent in preparation, a party of us set out for Phantom Mountain. Phantom Mountain, interrupted Tom. Where is it? I don't know exactly. It's somewhere in the Rockies, but the exact location is a mystery. That's why I need your help. You will soon understand the reason. Well, as I said myself, Falwell and the others were not exactly prepossessing sort of men, started west. When we got to a small town near Leadville, Colorado, the men insisted that I must now proceed in secret and consent to be blindfolded, as they were not yet ready to reveal the secret of the place where they made the diamonds. I did not want to agree to this, but they insisted, and I gave in, foolishly perhaps. At any rate, I was blindfolded one night, placed in a wagon, and we drove off into the mountains. After traveling some distance, I was led, still blindfolded, up a steep trail, 
When the bandage was taken off my eyes, I saw that I was in a large cave. The men were with me, and they apologized for the necessity that caused them to blindfold me. They said they were ready to proceed with the making of diamonds, but I must promise not to seek to discover the secret until they gave me permission. Nor was I to attempt to leave the cave. I had to agree. Next, they demanded that I give them a large sum, which I had promised when they showed me conclusively that they could make diamonds. I refused to do this until I had seen some of the precious stones, and they agreed that this was fair, but said it would have to wait a few days. Well, I waited, and all that while I was virtually a prisoner in the cave. All I could learn was that it was in the midst of a great range near the top, and that one of the peaks was called Phantom Mountain. Why, I did not learn until later. At last one night, during a terrific thunderstorm, the leader of the diamond makers, Falwell, announced that I could now see the stones made. The men had been preparing their chemicals for some days previous. I was taken into a small chamber of the cave, and there saw quite a complicated apparatus. Part of it was a great steel box with a lever on it. We will let you make some diamonds for yourself, Falwell said to me, and he directed me to pull the lever of the box at a certain signal. The signal came just as a terrific crash of thunder shook the very mountain inside of which we were. The box of steel got red hot, and when it cooled off it was opened, and was given a handful of white stones. Were they diamonds? asked Tom eagerly. Mr. Jinks held out one hand, in the palm glittered a large stone, ostensibly a diamond. In the rays of the moon it showed all the colors of the rainbow, a beautiful gem. That is one of the stones I made, or rather that I supposed I had made, went on Mr. Jinks. It is one of several I have, but they have not been cut and polished as has this one. Naturally I was much impressed by what I saw, and after I had made certain tests which convinced me that the stones in the steel box were diamond. I paid over the money as I had promised. That was my undoing. How? As soon as the men got to cash, they had no further use for me. The next I remember is eating a rude meal, while we discussed the future of making diamonds. I knew nothing more until I found myself back in the small hotel at Indian Ridge, whence I had gone some time previous, with the men, to the cave in the mountain. What happened? asked Tom much surprised by the unexpected outcome of the affair. I had been tricked, that was all. As soon as the men had my money, they had no further use for me. They did not want me to learn the secret of their diamond-making, and they drugged me, carried me away from the cave, and left me in the hotel. Didn't you try to find the cave again? I did, but without avail. I spent some time in the Rockies, but no one could tell where Phantom Mountain was. In fact, you had heard of it, and I was nearly lost searching for it. I came back east, determined to get even. I had given the men a very large sum of money, and in exchange they had given me several diamonds. Probably the stones are worth nearly as much as the money I invested, but I was cheated, for I was promised an equal share in the profits. These were denied me, and I was tricked. I determined to be revenged, or at least to discover the secret of making diamonds. It is my right. I agree with you, spoke Tom. But up to the time I met you on Earthquake Island, I could form no plan for discovering Phantom Mountain, and learning the secret of the diamond makers, went on Mr. Jinks. I carried the gems about with me, as you doubtless saw, when we were on the island. But I knew I needed an airship in which to fly over the mountain and pick out the location of the cave where the diamonds are made. But how can you locate it, if you were blindfolded when you were taken there, Mr. Jinks? I forgot to tell you that on our journey into the mountains, and just before I was carried into the cave, I managed to raise one corner of the bandage. I caught a glimpse of a very peculiarly shaped cliff. It is like a great head, standing out in bold relief against the moonlight, when I saw it. That head of rock is near the cave. It may be the landmark by which we can locate Phantom Mountain. 
Perhaps, admitted the young inventor. What I want to know is this, went on Mr. Jinks. Will you go with me on this quest? Go in your airship to discover the secret of the diamond makers? If you will, I will share with you whatever diamonds we can discover or make, besides paying all expenses. Will you go, Tom Swift? The young inventor did not know what to answer. How far was Mr. Jinks to be trusted? Were the stones he had real diamonds? Was his story fantastical as it sounded? True. Would it be safe for Tom to go? The lad asked himself these questions. Mr. Jinks saw his hesitation. Here, said the strange man, I will prove what I say. Take this diamond. I intended it for you anyhow. For what you did for me on Earthquake Island, take it, and give it to the person for whom you were about to purchase a diamond tonight. But first of all, take it to a gem expert and get his opinion. That will prove the truth of what I say, Tom Swift, and I feel sure that you will cast your lot in with mine and help me to discover the secret of Phantom Mountain and aid me to get my rights from the diamond makers. End of chapter 3 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 4 Andy Foger Gets a Fright Tom Swift considered a few minutes. On the face of it, the proposition appealed to him. He had been home some time now after his adventures on Earthquake Island, and he was beginning to long for more excitement. He searched for the mysterious mountain and the cave of the diamond makers might offer a new field for him, but there came to him a certain distrust of Mr. Jinks. I don't like to doubt your word, began Tom slowly, but you know, Mr. Jinks, that some of the greatest chemists have tried in vain to make diamonds, or at best, they have made only tiny ones, to think that any man or a set of men made real diamonds as large as the ones you have. Doesn't seem, well, and Tom hesitated. You mean you can hardly believe me, asked Mr. Jinks. I guess that's it, assented Tom. I don't blame you a bit, exclaimed the odd man. In fact, I didn't believe it when they told me they could make diamonds, but they proved it to me. I'm ready now to prove it to you. I'll tell you what I'll do. Here's this one stone cut ready for setting. Here's another uncut. And Mr. Jinks drew from his pocket what looked like a piece of crystal. Take them to any jeweler. He resumed, to the one in whose place I saw you tonight. I'll abide by the verdict you get, and I'll come here tomorrow night and hear what you have to say. When you come at night, asked Tom, thinking there was something suspicious in that. Because my life might be in danger if I was seen talking to you, and showing you diamonds in the daytime, especially just now. Why at this particular time? For the reason that the diamond makers are on my trail. As long as I remained quiet after their shabby treatment of me and did not try to discover their secret, they were all right. But after I realized that I had been cheated out of my rights, and when I began to make an investigation with a view of to discovering their secret whereabouts, I received mysterious and anonymous warnings to stop. But I did not. I came east and tried to get help to discover the cave of the diamond makers. But I was unsuccessful. I needed an airship. As I said, and no person who could operate one would agree to go with me on the quest. Again, I received a warning to drop all search for the diamond makers. But I persisted, and about a week ago I found I was being shadowed. Shadowed by whom? asked Tom. By a man I never remember seeing, but who, I have no doubt, is one of the diamond-making gang. Do you think he means you harm? I'm sure of it. That is the reason I have to act so in secret, and come to see you at night. I don't want those scoundrels to find out what I'm about to do. On my return from Earthquake Island, I again endeavored to interest an airship man in my plan, but he evidently thought me insane. Then I thought of you, as I had done before, but I was afraid you too would laugh at my proposition. 
However, I decided to come here, and I did. It seemed almost providential that my first view of you was in a jewelry shop, looking at diamonds. I took it as a good omen. Now it remains with you. May I call here tomorrow night and get your answer? Tom Swift made up his mind quickly. After all, it would be easy enough to find out if the diamonds were real. If they were, he could then decide whether or not to go with Mr. Jinx on the mysterious quest. So he answered, I'll consider the matter, Mr. Jinx. I'll meet you here tomorrow night. In the meanwhile, for my own satisfaction, I'll let an expert look at these stones. Get the greatest diamond expert in the world, and he'll pronounce them perfect, predicted the odd man. Now I'll bid you good night and be going. I'll be here at this time tomorrow. As Mr. Jinx turned aside, there was a movement among the trees in the orchard, and a shadowy figure was seen hurrying away. Who's that? asked the diamond man in a hoarse whisper. Did you see that, Tom Swift? Someone was here listening to what I said. Perhaps it was the man who has been shadowing me. I think not. I guess it was Eradicate Sampson, a man who does work for us, said Tom. Is that true, Rad? he called. Yes, sir, Massa Tom, I, here I is, answered the voice of the man. But it came from an entirely different direction than that in which the shadowy figure had been seen. Where are you, Rad? called the young inventor. Right here, was the reply, and the man came from the direction of the stable. I were just out seeing if my mule boomerang were all right. Sometimes he's restless and don't sleep like he oughter. Then that wasn't you over in the orchard, asked Tom in some uneasiness. No, sir, I ain't been in the orchard. I were sleeping in my shack till just a few minutes ago when I got up and went in to see Boomerang. I had a dream that someone were trying to steal him, and it sort of stirred me like. If it wasn't your man, it was someone else, said Mr. Jinks decidedly. We'll have a look, exclaimed Tom. Here, Rad, come over and scurry among those trees. We just saw someone sneaking around. I'll sure do that, cried the man. Maybe it were somebody after Boomerang. I'll find him. I don't believe it was anyone after the mule, murmured Mr. Jinks. But it certainly was someone. More likely someone after me. The three made a hasty search among the trees, but the intruder had vanished, leaving no trace. They went out into the road, which the moon threw into bold relief along its white stretch and there was no figure scurrying away. Whoever it was is gone, spoke Tom. You can go back to bed, Rad, for the man of late had been sleeping in a shack on the swift premises. And I guess it's time for me to go, too, added Mr. Jinks. I'll be here tomorrow night, Tom, and I hope your answer will be favorable. Tom did not sleep well the remainder of the night for his fitful slumbers were disturbed by dreams of enormous caves filled with diamonds, with dark, shadowy figures trying to put him into a red-hot steel box. Once he awakened with a start, and put his hand under his pillow to feel if the two stones Mr. Jenks had given him were still there. They had not been disturbed. Tom made up his mind to find out if the stones were really diamonds, before saying anything to his father about the chance of going to seek Phantom Mountain, and the young inventor wished to get the opinion of some other jeweler than Mr. Track, at least at first. Though if this one proves to be a good gem, I'll have Mr. Track set it in a brooch and give it to Mary for her birthday, decided the young inventor. Yes, I'll take a run over to Chester in the Butterfly and see what one of the jewelers there has to say. In addition to his big airship Red Cloud, Tom owned a small, swift monoplane, which he called Butterfly. This had been damaged by Andy Fulger just before Tom left on the trip that ended at Earthquake Island. But the monoplane had been repaired, and Andy had left town, not having returned since. Telling his father that he was going off on a little business trip, which he often did in his airplane, Tom, with the aid of Mr. Jackson, the engineer, wheeled the Butterfly out of its shed. Adjusting the mechanism and seeing that it was in good shape, Tom took his place in one of the two seats, for the monoplane would carry two. Mr. Jackson then spun the propellers, and with a crackle and roar, 
the motor started. Over the ground ran the dainty little airplane, until having momentum enough, Tom tilted the wing planes and the machine sailed up into the air. Rising about a thousand feet and circling about several times to test the wind currents, Tom headed his craft toward Chester, a city about fifty miles from Shopton. In his pocket, snugly tucked away, were the two stones Mr. Jinks had given him. It was not long before Tom saw, looming up in the distance, the church spires and towering factory chimneys of Chester, for his machine was a speedy one and could make ninety miles an hour when driven. But now a slower speed satisfied our hero. I'll just drop down outside of the city, he reasoned, where too much of a crowd gathers when I land in the street. Besides, I might frighten horses, and then, too, it's hard to get a good start on the street. I'll leave it in some barn until I want to go back. Tom sent his craft down in order to pick out a safe place for landing. He was then over the suburbs of the city and was following the line of a straight country road. Looks like a good place there, he murmured. I'll shut off the motor and ball plane down. Suiting the action to the word, Tom shut off his power. The little craft dipped toward the ground, but the lad threw up the forward planes and caught a current of air that sent him skimming along horizontally. As he got nearer to the ground, he saw the figure of a lad riding a bicycle along the country highway. Something about the figure struck Tom as being familiar, and he recognized the cyclist a moment later. It's Andy Folger, said Tom in a whisper. I wondered where he had been keeping himself since he damaged the butterfly. Evidently he doesn't dare venture back to Shopton. Well, here's where I give him a scare. Tom's monoplane was making no more noise now than a soaring bird. He was gliding softly toward the earth and with the plan in his mind of administering some sort of punishment to the bully, he aimed the machine directly at him. Nearer and nearer shot the monoplane, as quietly as a sheet of paper might fall, and he pedaled on, never looking up nor behind him. A moment later, as Tom threw up his head planes to make his landing more easy, and just as he swooped down at one side of the cyclist, our hero let out, a most alarming yell right into Andy's ear. Now I've got you, he shouted. I'll teach you to slice my airplane. Come with me. And he gave one look at the white bird-like apparatus that had flown up beside him so noiselessly, and being too frightened to recognize Tom's voice, must have thought that he had been overtaken by some supernatural visitor. And he gave a yell like an Indian about to do a stage scalping act and fairly dived over the handlebars of his bicycles, sprawling in a heap on the dusty road. I guess that will hold you for a while, observed Tom grimly, as he put on the ground brake and brought his monoplane to a stop, not far from the fallen rider. End of Chapter 4 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 5 A Mysterious Man for several minutes, Andy Foger did not arise. He remained prostrate in the dust, and Tom, observing him, thought perhaps the bully might have been seriously injured. But a little later, Andy cautiously raised his head and inquired in a frightened voice, Is it gone? Is what gone? asked Tom grimly. At the sound of his voice, Andy looked up. Was that you, Tom Swift? he demanded. Did you knock me off my wheel? My monoplane and I together did, was the reply, or rather, we didn't. It was the nervous reaction caused by your fright and the knowledge that you had done wrong that made you jump over the handlebars. That's the scientific explanation. You, you did it, stammered Andy. Getting to his feet, he wasn't hurt much, Tom thought. Have it your own way, resumed our hero. Did you think it was a hobgoblin in a chariot of fire after you, Andy? Oh, never mind what I thought. I'll have you arrested for this. Well, you, delighted as the boys say, hop in my airship, and I'll take you right into town. And when I get there, I'll make a charge of malicious mischief against you for breaking the propeller of the butterfly and slashing her wings. I've mended her up, however, so she goes better than ever 
and I can take you to the police station in jig time. Want to come, Andy? This was too much for the bully. He knew that Tom would have a clear case against him, and he did not dare answer. Instead, he shuffled over to where his wheel lay, picked it up, and rode slowly off. Good riddance, murmured Tom. He looked about and saw that he was near a house, in the rear of which was a good-sized barn. Guess I'll ask if I can leave the butterfly there, he murmured, and ringing the doorbell he was greeted by a man. I'll pay you if you let me store my machine in the barn a little while, until I go into the city and return, spoke the lad. Indeed, you're welcome to leave it there without pay, was the answer. I'm interested in airships, and I'll consider it a favor if you'll let me look yours over while it's here. Tom readily agreed, and a few minutes later he had caught a trolley going into the city. He was soon in one of the largest jewelry stores of Chester. I'd like to get an expert opinion as to whether or not these stones are diamonds, spoke Tom to the polite clerk who came up to wait on him, and our hero handed over the two gems which Mr. Jinks had given him. I'm willing to pay for the appraisal, of course, the young inventor added, as he saw the clerk looking rather doubtfully at him, for Tom had on a rough suit, which he always donned when he flew in his monoplane. I'll turn them over to Mr. Porter, a gem expert, said the clerk. Please be seated. The young man disappeared into a private office with the stones, and Tom waited. He wondered if he was going to have his trouble for his pains. Presently, two elderly gentlemen came from the little room, on the glass door of which appeared the word Diamonds. Who brought these stones in? asked one of the men, evidently the proprietor, from the deference paid him by the clerk. The latter motioned to Tom. Will you kindly step inside here? requested the elderly man. When the door was closed, Tom found himself in a room which was mostly taken up with a bench for the display of precious stones, a few chairs, and some lights arranged peculiarly, while various scales and instruments stood on the table. "'You wished an opinion on, on these?' queried the proprietor of the place. Tom noticed at once the word diamonds was not used. I wanted to find out if they were of any value, he said. Are they diamonds? Would you mind stating where you got them? asked the other of the two men. Is that necessary? inquired the lad. I came by them in a legitimate manner, if that's what you mean, and I can satisfy you on that point. I'm willing to pay for any information you may give me as to their value. Oh, uh, it isn't that the proprietor hastened to assure him. But these are diamonds of such a peculiar kind, so perfect and without a flaw, that I wondered from what part of the world they came. Then they are diamonds, asked Tom eagerly. The finest I have ever tested, declared the other man, evidently Mr. Porter, the gem expert. They are a joy to look at, Mr. Roberts, he went on, turning to the proprietor, if it is possible to get a supply of them, you would be justified in asking half as much again as we charge for African or Indian diamonds. The Kimberley products are not to be compared to these. And he looked at the two stones in his hand, the one cut and sparkling brilliantly, the other in a rough state. Do you care to state where these diamonds came from? asked Mr. Roberts, looking critically at Tom. I had rather not, answered the lad. It is enough for me to know that they are diamonds. How much is your charge? Nothing, was the unexpected answer. We are very glad to have had the opportunity of seeing such stones. Is there any chance of getting any more? Perhaps, answered Tom, as he accepted the gems which the expert held out to him. Then might we speak for a supply, went on Mr. Roberts eagerly. We will pay you the full market price. What is the value of these stones? asked Tom. Mr. Roberts looked at his gem expert. It is difficult to say, was the answer of the man who had handed Tom the gems. They are so far superior to the usual run of diamonds that I feel justified in saying that the cut one would bring fifteen hundred dollars anywhere. In fact, I would offer that for it. The other is larger, though what it would lose in cutting would be hard to say. I would say it is worth two thousand dollars as it is now. 
Thirty-five hundred dollars for these two stones?' exclaimed Tom. "'They are worth every cent of it,' declared Mr. Roberts. "'Do you want to sell?' Tom shook his head. He could scarcely believe the good news. Mr. Jinks had told the truth. Now the young inventor could go with him to seek the diamond makers. "'Can you get any more of these?' went on Mr. Roberts. "'I think so. That is, I don't know. I'm going to try,' answered the lad. "'Then if you succeed, I wish you would sell us some,' fairly begged the proprietor of the store. "'I will,' promised Tom. But he little knew what lay before him, or perhaps he would not have made that promise. He thanked the diamond merchant for his kindness, and arranged to have the cut stones set in a pin for Miss Nestor. The uncut gem Tom took away with him. Thinking of many things, and wondering how best to start in his airship, Red Cloud, for the mysterious Phantom Mountain, Tom hurried back to where he had left the monoplane, wheeled it out, and was soon soaring through the air toward Shopton. I think I'll go with Mr. Jinks, he decided, as he prepared for a landing in the open space near his airplane shed. It will be a risky trip, perhaps, but I've taken risks before. When Mr. Jinks comes tonight, I'll tell him I'll help him get his rights and discover the secret of the diamond makers. As Tom was wheeling the butterfly into the shed, Eradicate came out to help him. "'There's a gentleman here to see you, Massa Tom,' said the man. "'Who is it?' "'I don't know. He keep asking if you de lad what done bust up Earthquake Island and send lightning flashes up to de sky, and all such questions like that.' "'It isn't Mr. Damon, is it, Rand? He hasn't been around in some time.' "'No, Massa Tom, it ain't him.' I know that blessin' man good and proper. I just wish he'd bless my mule boomerang some day and take some of de temper out of him. No, sir, it ain't Master Damon. De gentleman's in de airship shed waiting for you. In the airship shed? No strangers are allowed in there, Rad. I knows it, Master Tom, but he done persisted hisself into it, and he wouldn't come out when I told him, and your papa and Mr. Jackson ain't home. I'll see about this, exclaimed Tom, striding to the large shed where the red cloud was kept. As he entered it, he saw a man looking over the wonderful craft. Did you want to see me? asked Tom sharply, for he did not like strangers prowling around. I did, and I apologize for entering here, but I am interested in airships, and I thought you might want to hire a pilot. I am in need of employment, and I have had considerable to do with balloons and airplanes but never with an airship like this, which combines the two features. Do you wish to hire anyone? No, I don't, replied Tom sharply, for he did not like the looks of the man. I was told that you did, was the rather surprising answer. Who told you? The man looked all around the shed before replying, as if fearful of being overheard, then stepping close to Tom, he whispered, Mr. Jinks told me. Mr. Jinks? Tom could not conceal his astonishment. Yes, Mr. Barco Jinks, but I did not come here to merely ask you for employment. I would like to hire out to you, but the real object of my visit was to say this to you. The man approached still closer to Tom, and in a lower voice, and one that could scarcely be heard, he fairly hissed, Don't go with Barco Jinks to see the diamond makers. Then, before Tom could put out a hand to detain him, had the lad so wished, the man turned suddenly and fairly ran from the shed. End of Chapter 5 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 6 Mr. Damon is on hand The young inventor stood almost spellbound for a few moments. Then, recovering himself, he made a dash for the door through which the mysterious man had disappeared. Tom saw him sprinting down the road and was half-minded to take after him, but a cooler thought warned him that he had better not. He may be one of those men who are on Mr. Jinks' trail, reasoned Tom, in which case it might not be altogether safe to attempt to stop him and make him explain. Or he might be a lunatic, and in that case it wouldn't be altogether healthy to interfere with him. I'll just let him go and tell Mr. Jinks about him when he comes tonight. But I must warn Rad never to let him in here again. 
he might damage the airship. Calling to the man, Tom pointed to the stranger, who was almost out of sight down the road, and said earnestly, Rand, do you see that fellow? I sure do, Master Tom, but I sort of has to strain my eyes to do it. He's going like my mule boomerang does when he's coming home for to dinner. That's right, Rand. Well, never let that man set foot inside our fence again. If he comes and I'm home, call me. If I'm away, call Dad or Mr. Jackson. And if you're here alone, drive him away somehow. I will, Master Tom, exclaimed the man earnestly. And if I can't do it alone, I'll get Boomerang to help. Won't let that air mule get his heels on a person, and that person ain't going to come bothering around any more. That is, not right away. I believe you, Rad. Well, keep a lookout for him, and don't let him in. And with that, Tom entered the house to think over matters. They were beginning to assume an aspect he did not altogether like. Not that Tom was afraid of danger, but he preferred to meet it in the open, and the warning or threat of the mysterious man disquieted him. When Mr. Swift came home a little later, his son told him of the midnight interview with Mr. Jinks, for up to this time the aged inventor was unaware of it, and Tom also gave an account of the diamonds speaking of their value. And do you propose to go to Phantom Mountain in search of the makers of these gems, Tom? asked Mr. Swift. I had about decided to do so, Dad. And you're going in the Red Cloud? Yes. Who is going with you? Well, Mr. Jinx will go, of course, and I've no doubt but that if I mention the prospective trip to Mr. Damon, that he'll bless his skating cap or something like that and come along. I suppose so, Tom, and I'd like to have you take him, but I think you'll need someone else because from what you have told me, you are going out to a dangerous part of the country, and you may have to deal with unscrupulous men. Three of you are hardly enough to cope with them. You ought to have at least another member of your party. If I was not busy on my invention of a new wireless motor, I would go along, but I can't leave. You might take Mr. Jackson. No, you need him here to help you, Dad. How about Eradicate? Tom smiled. Rad would get homesick for his mule boomerang, and I'd have to bring him back just when we'd found the diamonds, replied the young inventor. No, we'll have to think of someone else. I'll ask Mr. Damon, and then I'll consider matters further. I expect to see Mr. Jinx tonight, and he may have someone in mind. Perhaps that will be a good plan. Well, Tom, I trust you will take good care of yourself and not run into unnecessary danger. Is the Red Cloud in good shape for the voyage? It needs looking over. I'm going to get right at it. It's a pretty indefinite sort of a quest you're going on, Tom, my son. How do you expect to find Phantom Mountain? Well, it's going to be quite a task. In the first place, we'll head for Leadville, Colorado, and then we'll go to Indian Ridge and make some inquiries. We may get on the track of the place that way. If we don't, why, I'll take the airship up as high as is necessary and sort of prospect until we see that big cliff that's shaped like a head. That will give us something to go by. Well, do the best you can. If you can discover the secret of making diamonds, it will be a valuable one. I guess it will, Dad, and Mr. Jinx is entitled to know it, for he paid his good money to that end. He has promised to go halves with me as payment for the use of the airship, and I must say the two diamonds he gave me last night have proved very valuable. Two diamonds, Tom? He only showed me one, an uncut gem. And Mr. Swift looked at his son. Oh, the other, uh, the other is, I left it with the jeweler. And Tom blushed a trifle as he thought of the present he contemplated making to Mary Nestor. That afternoon, as Tom was out in the shed of the Red Cloud, looking over the airship to see what would be necessary to do to it in order to get it in shape for a long trip, he heard voices outside. Yes, yes, I know the way in perfectly well, he caught. You needn't bother to come, my good fellow. Just step this way and I'll show you something worth seeing. I wonder if it's that mysterious man coming back, thought Tom. 
He dropped the tool he was using and hurried to the door. As he approached it, he heard the voice continue. Why, bless my shoelaces, Mr. Parker, you'll see a wonderful airship, I promise you. Wonderful. Bless my hat band, but I hope Tom is here. Mr. Damon, exclaimed our hero as he recognized the tones of his eccentric friend. But who was with him? A moment later he caught sight of the gentleman, who was always blessing himself or something. Behind him stood another man whose features Tom could not see plainly. Hello, Tom Swift, called Mr. Damon. Looking over the red cloud, eh? Does that mean you're off on another trip? I guess it does, answered the lad. Where to this time, if I may ask? I'm thinking of going off to the mountains to find a band of men engaged in making diamonds, replied Tom. Making diamonds? Bless my finger ring. Making diamonds? A trip to the mountains? Bless my disposition. But do you know I'd like to go with you? I was thinking of asking you, Mr. Damon. Were you, bless my heart, I'm glad you thought of me. You don't by any possible chance want another person, do you? We were thinking of having four in the party, Mr. Damon, and Tom wondered who was with his eccentric friend. Then bless my election ticket. This is the very chance for you, Mr. Parker, cried Mr. Damon. Will you go with us? It will be just what you need. And Mr. Damon stepped aside, revealing to Tom the features of Mr. Ralph Parker, the scientist who had correctly predicted the destruction of Earthquake Island. End of Chapter 6 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 7 Mr. Parker Predicts Tom Swift was a most generous lad, but when he saw that Mr. Damon had with him Mr. Parker, the gloomy scientist, who seemed to take delight in predicting disasters. Our hero's spirits were not exactly of the best. He would have much preferred not to take Mr. Parker on the quest for the diamond makers, but since Mr. Damon had mentioned it, he did not see how he could very well refuse. But perhaps he won't care to go, thought Tom. He was undeceived a moment later, however, for the scientist remarked, I'm very glad to meet you once more, Mr. Swift. I have scarcely thanked you enough for what you did for us in erecting your wireless station on Earthquake Island, which, as you recall, I predicted would sink into the sea. It did. I'm glad to say, not because I like to see islands destroyed, but because science has been vindicated. Now I have just heard you remark that you are about to set off to the mountain in search of some men who are making diamonds. I need hardly state that this is utterly useless, for no diamonds, commercially valuable, can be made by men. But the trip may be valuable in that it will permit me to demonstrate some scientific facts. Therefore, if you will permit me, I will be very glad to accompany you and Mr. Damon. I shall be delighted in short, and I can start as soon as you are ready. There's no hope for it, thought Tom dismally. I suppose he'll wake up every morning and predict that before night the world will come to an end or he'll prophesy that the airship will blow up and vanish when about seven miles above the clouds. Well, there's no way out of it, so here goes. Thereupon Tom welcomed the scientist as cordially as he could and invited him to form one of the party that would set off in the airship to search for Phantom Mountain. Where's my jewelry box? exclaimed Mr. Damon when this formality was over. Tell me more about it, Tom. Which our hero did, stating the need for maintaining secrecy on account of the danger to Mr. Jinks. Mr. Damon and Mr. Parker both agreed to say nothing about the matter, and then the scientist became much interested in the red cloud, which he closely examined. He even complimented Tom on the skill shown in making it, and contrary to our hero's expectation, did not predict that it would blow up the next time it was used. How did you happen to arrive just at this time, Mr. Damon? asked Tom. It was partly due to Mr. Parker, was the answer. I had not seen him since we were rescued from the island. Till a few days ago he called me at my home. I happened to mention that you lived near here and suggested that he might like to see some of your inventions. He agreed, and we came over in my auto. And now, bless my liver pen, I find you about to start off on another trip. And have you fully decided to go with me? asked Tom. 
There may be danger, and I don't like the way that mysterious man behaved. Oh, bless my revolver, cried Mr. Damon. I'm used to danger by this time. Of course, I'm going, and so is Mr. Park. Do you know? And the man, who was always blessing something, came closer to the lad and whispered, Do you know, Tom? Mr. Parker is a very peculiar individual. I'm sure of it, answered the young inventor, looking at the gentleman in question, who was then inside the airship cabin. But he's all right, even if he is predicting unpleasant things, went on Mr. Damon. I think we'll get better acquainted with him after a bit. I hope so, agreed Tom, but he did not realize then how close his companionship with Mr. Parker was to be, nor what dangers they were to share later. Friends talked at considerable length of the prospective trip, and Tom by this time had ascertained what needed to be done to the airship to get it in shape to travel. It would take about a week, and in the meanwhile, Mr. Damon would go home and get his affairs in order for the voyage. Tom's father was introduced to Mr. Parker, and the former finding that the scientist held some views in common with him, invited the gloomy predictor to remain at the Swift home until the Red Cloud was ready to sail. Tom could not repress a groan at this, but he decided he would have to make the best of it. Mr. Damon left for home that afternoon, promising to be on hand at the time set to start for Phantom Mountain. Tom was up waiting for Mr. Jinks at twelve o'clock that night. Shortly after the hour, he saw a dark figure steal into the orchard. At first he feared lest it might be one of the spies who were, he was now convinced, on the trail of the man who was seeking to discover the secret of the diamond makers but a whistle which came to the lad's ear a moment later, that being a signal Mr. Jinks had agreed to sound, told Tom that it was none other than the visitor he expected. All right, Mr. Jinks, I'm here, called Tom cautiously. Come over this way. And he went out from the shadow of the house, where he had been waiting, and met the man. We'll go into my private workshop, the youth added, leading the way. Have you decided to go with me? asked Mr. Jinks in an anxious whisper. Did you find the diamonds to be real ones? I did, and I'm going, spoke Tom. Good. That relieves my mind. But we are still in danger. I was followed by my shadower today and only succeeded in shaking him off just before coming here. I don't believe he knows what I am about to do. Oh, yes, he does, said Tom. He does? How? because he was here and warned me against you. You don't mean it. Well, they are getting desperate. We must be on our guard. What sort of a man was he? Tom described the fellow, and Mr. Jinks stated that this tallied with the appearance of the person who had been shadowing him. But we'll fool them yet, cried Tom, who had now fully entered into the spirit of the affair. If they can follow us in the Red Cloud, they're welcome to it. I think we'll get ahead of them. He then told of Mr. Damon and Mr. Parker, and Mr. Jinks agreed that it would add to the strength of the party to take these two gentlemen along. Though I can't say I care so much for Mr. Parker, he added, but now as to ways and means, when can we start? Thereupon he and Tom talked over details in the seclusion of the little office and arranged to leave Shopton in about a week. And meanwhile, the airship would be overhauled, stocked with supplies and provisions and be made ready for a swift dash to the mountains. And now I must be going, said Mr. Jinks. I have a great deal to do before I can start on this trip, and I hope I am not prevented by any of those men who seem to be trailing me. How could they prevent you? Tom wanted to know. Oh, there are any number of ways, was the answer, but I'm glad you found that my diamonds were real. We'll soon have plenty if all goes well. As Mr. Jenks left the shop, he started back in some alarm. What's the matter? asked Tom. Over there. I thought I saw a figure sneaking along under the trees. That man, perhaps? Let's eradicate our helper, replied Tom with a laugh. I posted him there to see that no strangers came in the orchard. Everything all right, Brad? he asked, raising his voice. Yes, sir, Master Tom. Nobody been around yet this night. That's good. You can go to bed now and Eradicate, yawning loudly, went to his shack. A little later, Tom sought his own room, Mr. Jinks having hurried off to town, where he was boarding. The next few days saw Tom busily engaged on the airship. 
making some changes and a few repairs that were needed. His father, Eradicate, and Mr. Jackson helped him. As for Mr. Parker, the scientist, he went about the place, being much interested in the various machines which Tom or Mr. Swift had patented. At other times, the scientist would stroll about the extensive grounds, making what he said were observations. One afternoon, Tom saw him apparently much excited, kneeling down back of a shed, with his ear to the ground. "'What is the matter?' asked the lad, thinking perhaps Mr. Parker might be ill. "'Have you ever had any earthquakes here, Tom Swift?' asked the scientist quietly. "'Earthquakes? No. We had enough of them on the island.' "'And you are going to have one here in about two minutes,' cried Mr. Parker. "'I predict that this place will be shaken by a tremendous shock very soon. "'We had all better get away from the vicinity of buildings.' "'What makes you think there will be an earthquake?' asked Tom. "'Because I can hear the rumbling beneath the ground at this very minute. "'It is increasing in volume, showing that the tremors are working this way. "'There will soon be a great subterranean upheaval. "'Listen for yourself.' Tom cast himself down on the grass, placing his ear close to the ground. He did hear a series of dull thuds. He arose not a little alarmed. There had never been any earthquakes in Shopton, yet he had great respect for Mr. Parker's scientific attainments. Just then, Eradicate Samson came along. He saw Tom and Mr. Parker lying flat on the ground, and surprise showed on his honest face. "'For de land's sakes!' cried Eradicate. "'What am de matter now, Master Tom?' Earthquake coming, answered Tom briefly. Better get away from the buildings, Rad. They might fall. Tom's face showed the alarm he felt. What would happen to all his valuable machines to the Red Cloud? Earthquake, murmured Eradicate, and he too cast himself down to listen. A moment later, he rose with a laugh. What's the matter? cried Tom. Why, dat ain't no earthquake, declared the man. No, then perhaps you know what it is, said Mr. Parker somewhat sharply. Of course I knows what it am, answered Eradicate with dignity. That noise am my mule boomerang kicking in his stable on account of me not feeding him yet. That's what it am. I is going right now to give him his oats, and then ye see they know he stop. Boomerang always kick that way. When he's hungry, I show you. And sure enough, when Eradicate had gone to the mule stable, which was near where Mr. Parker had heard the mysterious sounds, they immediately ceased. That mule was all the earthquake there was around here, said the man as he came out. Mr. Parker walked away saying nothing, and Tom did not make any comments just then. End of Chapter 7 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 8 Off for the West it was a great relief to Tom to find that there was no danger from an earth tremor. Now that he had made up his mind to go in search of the diamond makers, he wanted nothing to interfere with it, lest the feelings of Mr. Parker might be hurt by the mistake he had made. The young inventor cautioned Eradicate not to say anything more about the matter. Deed, and I won't, the man promised. I was only too glad there weren't no earthquake. That's what I is. As for Mr. Parker, did not appear much put out by his error in predicting. I am sure that what I heard was a tremor, due to some distant earthquake shock, he said. Mule's kicking was only a coincidence. And Tom let him have his way about it. The week was drawing to a close, and the Red Cloud was nearly in shape for the voyage. At almost the last minute, Tom found that he needed some electrical apparatus for the airship. And as he had to go to Chester for it, he decided he would make the trip in his monoplane and while in the city, but also get the diamond pin he was having made for Mary Nestor. He started off early one morning in the swift little craft Butterfly, and soon had reached Chester. The diamond brooch was ready for him. It is one of the most beautiful stones we have ever set, the diamond merchant told him. Don't forget, if you find any more, Mr. Swift, to let us have a chance to bid on them. I may, Tom promised rather indefinitely. Then, having purchased his electrical supplies, he made a quick trip to Shopton, stopping on the way to call on Miss Nestor. "'Why, Tom, I am delighted to see you,' cried the girl, blushing prettily. "'Did you come for some apple turnovers?' And she laughed, as she referred to a call Tom had once paid, when a new cook had been engaged. 
and when the pastry formed a feature of the meal. No oh, turnovers this time, said the young inventor. I came to wish you many happy returns of the day. Oh, you remember my birthday? How nice of you. And here is something else, added our hero rather awkwardly as he handed her the diamond pin. Oh, Tom, this for me? Oh, it's too lovely. It's far too much. It isn't half enough, he declared warmly. Oh, what a large diamond! Mary cried as she saw the sparkling stone. I never saw one so large and beautiful. It's just as easy to make them large as small, explained Tom. Make them? She looked the surprise she felt. Yes, I'm about to start for the place where diamonds are made. Oh, Tom, but isn't it dangerous? I mean, won't you have to go to some far country like Africa to get where the diamonds are made? Well, we are going on quite a trip, but not as far as that. And as for the danger, well, we'll have to take what comes. And he told her something of the proposed quest. Oh, it sounds, sounds scary, Mary exclaimed when she had heard of Mr. Jinks' experience. Do be careful, Tom. I will, he promised, and somehow he was glad that she had cautioned him thus, and in such tones as she had used. For Mary Nestor was a girl that any young chap would have been glad to have manifest an interest in him. Well, I guess I'll have to say good-bye, spoke Tom at length. We expect to start in a couple of days, and I may not get another chance to see you. Oh, I, I hope you come back safely, faltered Mary, and then she held out her hand, and Tom, well... It's none of our affair what Tom did after that, except to say that he hurried off, fairly jumped into his monoplane, and completed the trip home. As the Red Cloud has been fully described in a volume entitled Tom Swift and His Airship, we will not go into details about it now, sufficient to say that it was a combination of a biplane and a dirigible balloon. It could be used either as one or the other, and the gas bag feature was of value when the wind was too great to allow the use of the planes or when the motive power for some reason stopped. In that event, the airship could remain suspended far above the clouds if necessary. There was provision for manufacturing the gas on board. The Red Cloud was fitted up to accommodate about ten persons, though it was seldom that this number was carried. Two persons could successfully operate the machinery. There were sleeping berths, and in the main cabin a sitting room, a dining room, and a kitchen. There was also the motor compartment and a steering tower, from which the engines could be controlled. It was in this craft that the seekers after the diamond makers proposed undertaking the trip. Mr. Damon came on from his home in Waterfield about two days before the date set to leave, and Mr. Jenks had three days before this taken up his abode at the Swift home. Mr. Parker, as had been stated, was already there and he had put in his time making a number of scientific observations, though he had made no more predictions. Nothing more had been seen of the mysterious man who had warned Tom and the young inventor and Mr. Jinks, began to hope that they had thrown their enemies off the track. Though I don't imagine they'll give up altogether, said Mr. Jinks. They're too desperate for that. We'll have trouble with them yet. Well, it can't be helped decided Tom. We'll try to be ready for it when it comes. And then, dismissing the matter from his mind, he busied himself about the airship. The food and supplies had all been put aboard, and they expected to start the next morning. In order to make sure that any stones which they might succeed in getting from the diamond makers were real gems, a set of testing apparatus was taken along. Mr. Parker had had some experience in this line and in spite of the fact that he might make direful predictions. Tom was rather glad, after all, that the scientist was going to accompany them. What is worrying me, said Mr. Damon, is what we are going to do after we get to Phantom Mountain. What are your plans, Mr. Jinks? Will you go in and demand your share of the diamond-making business? I have a right to it, as I invested a large sum in it and I am entitled to more than a half-share. But, of course, I can't say what I'll do when until I get there. We may have to act very secretly. I'm inclined to think we will, said Tom. 
My plan would be to gain access to the cave, if possible, and watch them at work. We might be able to discover the secret of making diamonds, and, after all, that's what you want, isn't it, Mr. Jinks? Yes, I paid my money for the secret, and I ought to have it. If I can get it quietly, so much the better. If not, I'll fight for my rights. And he looked very determined. What's my powder horn? cried Mr. Damon. That's the way to talk. And so we're to go cruising about in the air, looking for a mountain shaped like a man's head. That's it, agreed Mr. Jinks. And when we find it, we will be near Phantom Mountain and the Diamond Makers. The final details were completed that night. The last of the supplies had been put aboard. The larder was well stocked. The diamond testing apparatus was stored safely away. And all that remained was for the adventurers to board the Red Cloud in the morning and soar away. That night, Tom was uneasy. Several times he got up and looked toward the shed where the airship was stored. He could not rid himself of the idea that the men, to whose interest it was that the diamond-making secret remain undiscovered, might attempt to wreck the airship before the start. Consequently, both Eradicate Sampson and Engineer Jackson were on guard. Tom looked from his window to the shed where the Red Cloud was housed. He saw nothing to cause him any uneasiness. I guess I'm just nervous, he mused, but all the same. I'll be glad when we've started. They were all up early the next morning, Mr. Damon beginning the day by blessing the sunrise and many other things that struck his fancy. The airship was wheeled out of the shed, and Tom gave her a final inspection. It's all right, he declared. All aboard. Now do be careful, begged Mr. Swift. Don't take too many chances, Tom. I'll not. The adventurers were in the forward part of the ship, and Tom had taken his place at the wheels and levers in the pilot house. As he was about to start the motor, he looked toward the road and saw a horse and carriage. In the vehicle was a girlish figure, at the sight of which Tom blushed and smiled. He waved his hand. I came to wish you good luck, cried Mary Nestor, for it was she in the carriage. Thanks, cried Tom, leaning from the window of the pilot house. It was good of you to get up so early. Oh, I'm always up early, she informed him. Look out that the motor doesn't scare your horse, Tom warned her. Oh, Dobbin doesn't mind anything, was her answer. I'll see that he doesn't run away with me, as long as you're not on earth to rescue me. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye, he called, and then he pulled the lever that set in motion the motor and whirled the great propellers about. They whizzed around with a roar and the red cloud, shivering and trembling with the vibration, rose in the air like some great bird. We're off for the west, and Phantom Mountain called Tom to his companions. As the airship soared upward, Eradicate Sampson ran forward from where he had been standing near his mule boomerang. He waved his hands and shouted something. Bless my headband, what does he want? asked Mr. Damon, watching him curiously. It sounds as if he were calling us to come back, spoke Mr. Parker. It's too late now, decided Tom. Maybe he forgot to tell us goodbye, but he felt a vague wonder at Eradicate's odd motions, for the man was pointing toward the stern of the airship, as if there was something wrong there, but the red clouds soared on. End of Chapter 8 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 9 A Warning by Wireless Rapidly the airship ascended, and when it was high over the town of Shopton, Tom headed the craft due west. Looking down, he tried to descry Mary Nestor in her carriage, but the trees were in the way, their interlocking branches hiding the girl. Tom did see crowds of other persons, though, thronging the streets of Shopton, for though the young inventor had made many flights, there was always a novelty about them that brought out the curious. A good start, Tom Swift, complimented Mr. Parker. Is it always as easy as this? Starting always is, was the answer, though, as the Irishman said, coming down isn't sometimes quite so comfortable. Bless my gizzard, that's so, cried the eccentric Mr. Damon. Can we volplane to earth in the red cloud, Tom? 
Yes, but not as easily as in the butterfly. However, I hope we will not have to. Now, Mr. Damon, if you will just take charge of the steering apparatus for a minute, I want to go aft. What for? I wish to see if everything is all right. I can't imagine why Eradicate was making those queer motions. Mr. Damon, who knew how to operate the Red Cloud, was soon guiding her on the course, while Tom made his way to the rear compartments, through the motor room where the stores of supplies and food were kept. He made a careful examination, looking from an after window, and even going out on a small open platform, but could discover nothing wrong. I guess Brad was just capering about without any special object, mused Tom. But it was not long after this that they learned to their dismay that the man had a method in his madness. On his way back through the motor room, Tom looked to the machinery and adjusted some of the auxiliary oil feeders. The various pieces of apparatus were working well. Though the engine had not yet been speeded up to its limit, Tom wanted to warm up first. Everything all right? asked Mr. Damon, as Tom rejoined them in the pilot house, which was just forward of the living room in the main cabin. Yes, I can't imagine what made Rad act that way. But I'll set the automatic steering gear now, Mr. Damon, and then you will be relieved. Mr. Jenks was gazing off toward the west, where he hoped to discover the secret of Phantom Mountain. How do you like it? asked Tom. It's great, replied the Diamond Man. I've never been in an airship before, and it's different than what I expected, but it's great. It's the only craft that will serve our purpose among the towering mountain peaks where the diamond makers are hidden. I hope we can find them. In a little while, the Red Cloud was skimming along at faster speed, guided by the automatic rudders, so that no one was needed in pilot house, since there was no danger of collisions. Airships are not quite numerous enough for that yet, though they may soon become so. Tom and the others devoted several hours to arranging their staterooms and bunks and getting their clothing stored away, and when this was done, Mr. Parker and Mr. Jinks sat gazing off into space. It's hard to realize that we are really in an airship, observed the Diamond Man. At first I thought I would be frightened, but I am not a bit. It doesn't seem as if anything could happen. Something is likely to happen soon, said Mr. Parker suddenly as he gazed at some weather instruments on the cabin wall. Bless my soul, don't say that, cried Mr. Damon. What is it? I think from my observations that we will soon have a hurricane, said the scientific man. There is every indication of it, and he seemed quite delighted at the prospect of his prediction coming true. A hurricane, cried Mr. Damon. I hope it isn't like the one that blew us to Earthquake Island. Oh, I think there will be no danger, spoke Tom. If it comes on to blow, we will ascend or descend. Out of the path of the storm, this craft is not like the ill-fated wizard. I can more easily handle the red cloud, even in a bad storm. I'm glad to hear that, remarked Mr. Jinks. It would be too bad to be wrecked before we got to Phantom Mountain. Well, I predict that we will have a bad storm, insisted Mr. Parker, and Tom could not help wishing that the scientist would keep his gloomy forebodings to himself. However, the storm had not developed up to noon when Tom, with Mr. Damon's help, served a fine meal in the dining room. In the afternoon, the speed of the ship was increased, and by night they had covered several hundred miles. Through the darkness, the red cloud kept on, making good time. Tom got up occasionally to look to the machinery, but it was all automatically controlled, and an alarm bell would sound in his stateroom when anything went wrong. Bless my napkin, exclaimed Mr. Damon the next morning as they sat down to a breakfast of fruit, ham, and eggs, and fragrant coffee. This is living as well as in a hotel, and yet we are. How far are we above the earth, Tom? he asked, turning to the young inventor. About two miles now. I just sent her up as I thought I detected that storm Mr. Parker spoke of. I told you it would come, declared the scientist, and there was a small hurricane below them that morning, but only the lower edge of it caught the red cloud, and when Tom sent her up still higher, she found a comparatively quiet zone, where she slid along at good speed. 
That afternoon Tom busied himself about some wires and a number of complicated pieces of apparatus, which were in one corner of the main cabin. "'What are you doing now?' asked Mr. Jinks, who had been talking with Mr. Parker and showing that scientist some of the manufactured diamonds. "'Getting our wireless apparatus in shape,' answered the lad. "'I should have done it before, but I had so much to do that I couldn't get at it. I'm going to send off some messages.' Dad will want to know how we are doing. As he worked away, he also made up his mind to send another message in care of his father, for there was a receiving station in the Swift home, and to whom the message was addressed, Tom did not say, but we fancy some of our readers can guess. Finally, after several hours of work, the wireless was in shape to send and receive messages. Tom pulled over the lever, and a crackling sound was heard as the electricity leaped from the transmitters into space. Then he clamped the receiver on his ear. Already, he announced, has anybody any messages they wish sent? For with the courtesy of a true host, he was ready to serve his guests before he forwarded his own wireless notes. Just tell my wife that I'm enjoying myself, requested Mr. Damon. Bless my footstool. But this is great. We're off the earth yet connected with it. Mr. Jenks had no one to whom he wanted to send any word, but Mr. Parker wished to wire to a fellow scientist the result of some observations made in the upper air. Tom noted all the messages down, and then, when all was in readiness, he began to call his home station. He knew that either his father or Mr. Jackson, the engineer, could receive the wireless. But no sooner had the young inventor set off the first few dots and dashes representing S.I., his home station call, than he started and a look of surprise came over his face. They're calling us, he exclaimed. Who is? asked Mr. Jinks. My house, my father. He, he's been trying to get us ever since we started, but I didn't have the wireless in shape to receive messages. Oh, I hope it's not too late. Too late? Bless my soul, too late for what? gasped Mr. Damon, somewhat alarmed by Tom's manner. The lad did not answer at once. He was intently listening to a series of dots and dashes that clicked in the telephone receiver clamped to his left ear. On his face there was a look of worriment. Father has just sent me a message, he said. It's a warning flashed through space. He's been trying to get it to me since yesterday. What is it? asked Mr. Jenks, rising from his seat. The mysterious man is aboard the airship, hidden away, cried Tom. That's what Eradicate was trying to call to our attention as we started off. Eradicate saw his face at the rear window and tried to warn us. The mysterious man is a stowaway on board. End of chapter 9 Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 10 Dropping the Stowaway Tom's excited announcement startled Mr. Damon and the others as much as if the young inventor had informed them that the airship had exploded and was about to dash with them to the earth. The men leaped to their feet and started at the lad. A stowaway on board, cried Mr. Damon. Bless my soul, how did he? Are you sure that message is straight? asked Mr. Jinks. Did Eradicate see the man? He says he did, answered Tom. The man is hidden away on board, now probably among the stores and supplies. Where's my tomato sauce? exploded Mr. Damon. I hope he doesn't eat them all up. We must get him out at once, declared Mr. Jinks. I knew something would happen on this voyage. Came from Mr. Parker. I predicted it from the first. Tom thought considerable, but he did not answer the scientist just then. Another communication was coming to him by wireless. He listened intently. Father says, the lad told his companions, that Eradicate only had a glimpse of the man at the last moment. He was looking from the rear storeroom window. He's the same man who called on me that time. Rad remembers him very well. Bless my shoes, what's to be done? inquired Mr. Damon, looking around helplessly. We must get him out, that's all, declared Mr. Jinks with vigor. Get him out and drop him overboard. Drop him overboard? cried Mr. Parker in horror. Not exactly, but get rid of him, proceeded the diamond seeker. That man is one of my enemies. He has been sent by the band of diamond makers hidden among the mountains to spy on me, and if possible prevent me from seeking to discover their secret. 
He tried to work on Tom Swift's fears and frighten him from using his airship on this quest. Then, when he failed, the man must have sneaked into the shed and hidden himself in the ship. We must get rid of him, or he may wreck the Red Cloud. That's so, cried Tom. We must try to capture him. I think we had better. The lad paused and again listened to the wireless message. Father says Eradicate saw the man had a gun, so we must be careful. The young inventor translated the dots and dashes. Bless my powder horn, exploded Mr. Damon. We shall have to proceed cautiously then, spoke Mr. Jenks. If he is like any others in the gang, he is a desperate man. Better sneak up on him then, if we can, proposed Mr. Parker. There were enough of us to cope with one man, even if he is armed. You have weapons aboard, haven't you? he inquired of Tom. Yes, was the hesitating answer. But I don't want to use them if I can help it. Not only because of the danger and the dislike of shedding blood, but because a stray bullet might pierce the gas bag and damage the ship. That's so, agreed Mr. Jinks. Well, I guess if we go at it the right way, we can capture him without any shooting. But we must talk more quietly. We ought to have whispered. He may have heard us. I don't think so, replied Tom. The storeroom is far enough off so that he couldn't hear us. Besides, the motor makes such a racket that he couldn't distinguish what we were talking about, even if he heard our voices. So unless he heard the wireless working and suspects something from that, he probably doesn't know that we are aware of his presence aboard. Well, why do you think he has remained quiet all this while, Tom? asked Mr. Damon. Probably he wants to wait until the ship is farther out west, suggested Mr. Jinks. Then he will be nearer his friends and can get help if he needs it. And do you really believe he would destroy the Red Cloud? asked Mr. Parker. I think that all he is waiting for is a favorable chance, declared the diamond seeker. He would destroy the craft and us, too, if he could prevent us from discovering the secret of Phantom Mountain, I believe. Then we must get ahead of him, decided Tom quietly. I have just flashed to Dad a message telling him that we will heed his warning. Now, to capture the stowaway. And while we're about it, give him a good scare when we do get him suggested Mr. Jinks. How? asked Tom. Threaten to drop him overboard? Perhaps that will make him tell how he happened to get in our ship, and what are the plans of the gang of diamond makers. We may get valuable information that way. I don't believe you can scare such fellows much, was Tom's opinion, but he agreed to try. How are you going to capture him? asked Mr. Parker. If he has a gun, it won't be any too easy to go in the storeroom and drag him out. We'll have to use a little strategy, decided Tom, and then they discussed several plans. The one finally adopted was that Tom and Mr. Damon should enter the storeroom casually as if in search of food to cook for supper. They would discuss various dishes, and Mr. Damon was to express a preference for something in the food line, the box containing which was well back in the room. This would give the two a chance to penetrate to the far end of the apartment without arousing the suspicions of the hidden man, who doubtless would be listening to the conversation. And as soon as we get sight of him, you and I will jump right at him, Mr. Damon, said Tom. Jump before he has a chance to use his gun. Mr. Jinks and Mr. Parker will be waiting outside the room to catch him if he gets away from us. I'll have some ropes ready, and we'll tie him up, and, well, we'll decide later what to do with him. All right, I'm ready as soon as you are, Tom, said the eccentric man. Come ahead. They went softly to the storeroom and listened at the door. There was no sound heard save that made by the machinery. I wonder if he's really here, whispered Mr. Damon. We'll soon find out, answered Tom. Let's go in. They entered, and in pursuance of their plan, Tom and his friend talked of various foods. I think I'd like some of that canned lobster. The French dressing on, spoke the eccentric man. That's a way in the back end of the room, said Tom in a loud voice. It's under a lot of boxes. Then I'll help you get it out, bless my frying pan, but I am very fond of lobster, exclaimed Mr. Damon, in as natural tones as was possible under the circumstances. 
He and Tom moved cautiously back among the boxes and barrels. They were glancing about with eager eyes. Tom switched on an electric light, and the instant he did so, he was aware of a movement in a little space formed by one box, which was placed on top of two others. The lad saw a dark figure moving, as if to get farther out of sight. I've got him, cried Tom, making a dive for the shadow. A moment later, the young inventor was bowled over as a dark figure leaped over his head. Catch him, Mr. Damon, he cried. Bless my hat band, I, I, Mr. Damon's voice ended in a grunt. He, too, had been knocked down by the fleeing man. Look out, Mr. Jinks, cried Tom, to warn those on guard at the door of the storeroom. There was the report of a gun, some excited shouts, and when Tom could scramble to his feet and rush out, he beheld Mr. Parker calmly sitting on a struggling man while Mr. Jinks held a gun that was still smoking. We caught him, cried the scientist. Anybody hurt? asked Tom anxiously. No, I knocked up his gun as he fired, explained Mr. Jinks. Where are the ropes, Tom? The cords were produced, and the man, who had now ceased to struggle, was tightly bound. He uttered not a word, but he smiled grimly when Mr. Damon remarked, Guess I'll go back in the storeroom, Tom, and see how much food he ate. Oh, I guess he didn't take much, declared the land. He wasn't there long enough. Well, Farley Munson, so what you, is it? Asked Mr. Jinks as he surveyed the prisoner. Do you know him? Asked Tom in some surprise. He was in with the diamond makers, said Mr. Jinks. He was one of those who took me to the secret cave. But it will be the last time he ever goes there. How high up are we, Tom? About two miles. Why? I guess that will be far enough to let him fall, went on the diamond seeker. Come on, Mr. Damon. Help me throw him overboard. You, you're not going to throw me over with the airship two miles high, are you? gasped the man. Will you tell us what we want to know if we don't? asked Mr. Jinks. What do you want to know? How you got aboard, and what your object was in coming. That's easy enough. I had been hanging around the shed for several days, watching a chance to get in. Finally, I saw it when that man went in to feed his mule, and I slipped in, and hid in the airship. The stores were all in then, and I stowed myself away among the boxes. I had food and water, so I didn't touch any of yours. And he looked at Mr. Damon, who seemed much relieved. And what was your object? demanded Mr. Jenks. I wanted to prevent you from going to Phantom Mountain. How? Oh, by destroying the airship if need be, but I hope to accomplish it by other means. I would have stopped at nothing, though, to prevent you. You must keep away from there. And if we refuse, ask Tom. Then you'll have to take what comes. But not from you, exclaimed Mr. Jinx. We're going to get rid of you. The man's face showed the alarm he felt. Oh, don't worry, said Mr. Jinx quickly. We're not going to toss you overboard. We're not as desperate as your crowd, but we're going to get rid of you. And then go on before you can send any word to your confederates. We'll put you off in the most lonesome spot we can find, and I guess you'll be some time getting back to civilization. By that time, we'll have the secret of the diamonds. You never will, declared the man firmly and he would say nothing more, though by threats and promises Mr. Jinks tried to get from him something about the men in with him, and where the cave of diamonds was located. Heavily bound with ropes, the man was locked in a small closet, to be kept there until a favorable spot was reached for letting him go. Mr. Jinks' plan of dropping him down in some place where he would have difficulty in sending on word to his confederates was considered a good one. Three days later, in crossing over a lonely region near the Nebraska National Forest, Harley Munson, which was one of the names the spy went by, was dropped off the airship when it was sent down to within a few feet of the earth. It will take you some time to get to the telegraph office, said Mr. Jinks, as a package of food and a flask of water was tossed down to the stowaway. He shook his fist at those in the airship and shouted after them, You'll never discover the secret of Phantom Mountain. Yes, we will, declared Tom, as he sent the red cloud high into the air again. End of chapter 10
Tom Swift Among the Diamond Makers by Victor Appleton Chapter 11 A Weary Search During the three days when the stowaway had been kept a prisoner, the Red Cloud had made good time on her western trip. She was now about 250 miles from Leadville, Colorado, and Tom knew he could accomplish that distance in a short time. It was necessary, therefore, since they were so close to the place where the real search would begin, to make some more definite plans. "'We will need to replenish our supply of gasoline,' said Tom shortly after the stowaway had been dropped, and when the young inventor had made a general inspection of the airship. "'Is it all gone?' inquired Mr. Damon. "'Not all, but we will soon be in the wildest part of the Rocky Mountains, and gasoline is difficult to procure there.' so I want to fill all our reserve tanks. But I would rather do that before we get far into Colorado. Why? inquired Mr. Parker. Because airships are not so common, but what the appearance of one attracts attention. Ours is sure to be talked about and commented on. In that case, in spite of our precaution in putting Munson off in this lonely place, word of the Red Cloud being in the vicinity of Leadville may reach the diamond makers and put them on their guard. We want to take them unawares if we can. That's so, agreed Mr. Jinks. We had better get our gasoline at the first stopping place, then and proceed with our search. Our first object ought to be to look for the landmark, the head of stone. Then we can begin to prospect about a bit. My idea exactly, declared Tom. Well, then, I'll go down at the first place we cross, where we can get gasoline and then we'll be in a position to hover in the air for a long time without descending. The airship kept on her way, traveling slowly the remainder of that day, and at dusk, when there was less chance of big crowds seeing them, the Red Cloud was sent down on the outskirts of a large village. Tom and Mr. Damon went to a supply store and arranged to have a sufficient quantity of the gasoline taken out to the airship. It was delivered after dark, and little talk was occasioned by the few who were aware of the presence of the craft. Then, once more, they went aloft, and Tom sent several wireless messages to Shopton, including one to Miss Nestor. "'Please tell my wife that I am well, and that I have a good appetite,' said Mr. Damon. Mr. Parker sent a message to a scientific friend of his, stating that he made some observations among the mountains of the region in which the airship then was, and that the indications were, that a great landslide would soon take place. That won't worry us, spoke Tom, for we'll be far above it. I hope we will be near enough to enable me to observe it and make some scientific notes, came from Mr. Parker. I am positive that one of these mountain peaks that we saw today will disappear in a landslide within a few days. I have an instrument somewhat like the one that records earthquakes, and it has been acting strangely of late. Tom wondered what enjoyment Mr. Parker got out of life, when he was always looking for some calamity to happen. But the scientist seemed to take as much pleasure in his glooming forebodings now as he had on Earthquake Island. They reached the vicinity of Leadville the next day, but took care to keep high above the city, so that the airship could not be observed. With powerful glasses they examined the mountainous country, looking for the little settlement of Indian Ridge. There it is, exclaimed Mr. Jinks, just as dusk was settling down. I can make out the hotel I stopped at. Now we can really begin our search. The next thing is to find the stone head, and then I think I will have my bearings. We will begin the hunt for that landmark in the morning, said Tom. High in the air hovered the red cloud. At that distance above the earth she must have looked like some great bird and the adventurers thought it unlikely that anyone in the vicinity of Leadville would observe them. The quest for the great mountain peak that looked like a stone head was underway. Back and forth sailed the airship. Sometimes she was enveloped in fog, and no sight could be had of the earth below. At other times there were rainstorms, which likewise prevented a view. Mr. Parker was on the lookout for his predicted mountain landslide, but it did not occur, and he was much disappointed. It's queer I can't pick out that landmark, said Mr. Jinks after two days of weary searching, when their eyes were strained from long peering through telescopes. I'm sure it was around Indian Ridge, yet we've covered almost all the ground in this neighborhood. 
and I haven't had a glimpse of it. Perhaps it was destroyed in a landslide or some cataclysm of nature, suggested Mr. Parker. That is very possible. If that's the case, we're going to have a hard time to locate the cave of diamond makers, answered Mr. Jinks. But I hope it isn't so. They continued to search for another day, and then Tom, as they sat in the comfortable cabin of the airship that night, hovering almost motionless, for the motor had been shut down, made a proposition. Why don't we descend to some secluded place, he suggested, and wander around on foot, making inquiries of the miners. They may know where the stone head is, or they may even know about Phantom Mountain. Good idea, spoke Mr. Jinks. We'll do it. Accordingly, the next morning the red cloud was lowered in a good but lonely hiding place and securely moored. It was in a valley, well screened from observation, and the craft was not likely to be seen. But to guard against any damage being done to it by passing hunters or miners, Mr. Parker and Mr. Damon agreed to remain on guard in it, while Tom and Mr. Jenks spent a day or two traveling around making inquiries. The young inventor and his companion proceeded on foot to a small settlement where they hired horses on which to make their way about. They were to be gone two days, and in that time they hoped to get on the right trail. End of chapter 11